Well, if you want to uh, turn in your Bibles with me tonight so that you can follow along with the passage that we're going to be considering, this will be our third and final week looking in the book of Habakkuk, at least in verse uh, 1 to verse 11 of chapter 1. We're going to continue through that book uh, as we go forward in the months ahead. But for tonight, again, we're going to be looking at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 11. And the topic that we're going to consider here tonight from Habakkuk chapter 1 is a topic that relates to God's sovereignty. In other words, it relates to God's rule over all things, even us. And therefore, this ruffles some feathers amongst individuals. It may frustrate the hearts of many, and it even creates rebellious hearts, as we see happening in the world all around us. Nobody wants to have rule over them. Everybody wishes to be free. Everyone wishes to be able to exercise rule over their own domain. The reality is, is God is sovereign over all. All things, and that includes us. We're going to consider God's sovereignty tonight here in one particular aspect, uh, relating to the sovereignty over his ways. Meaning, surely we can go to him and and, uh, seek understanding of what he is doing, but when it comes down to it, it's God's way, and God's way will come to completion. So again, in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1 to 11, we're going to see that uh, here in tonight. It says, The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. The Lord answers Habakkuk saying, Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can once again come before your word and to consider the richness of it as we look to this passage for our third and final time this evening here tonight. God, we thank you that through this passage we have already learned a great deal about you and the fact that there are times when your ways may seem mysterious to us. There are times when we may misunderstand your ways. And here and tonight, God, we get to learn more about your sovereignty over all things, specifically here tonight, though, as it pertains to your ways. God, I thank you that you are one who does not bend or break at the uh, at the laments of individuals who try to uh, move your hand more quickly than you desire. God, I thank you that you are sovereign, and I pray that here and tonight we would all come to worship you for your sovereignty over us. For you alone are our creator. We are your creation, and we humbly submit ourselves before you now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, man is never satisfied with the amount of control that they have over their lives. This is something that goes all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to our first ancestors, Adam and Eve. When God created Adam and Eve, he placed them in the Garden of Eden with uh, little restriction. Uh, You'll remember in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 to verse 30, when God created man and woman, it says, And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God gave man and woman everything. There was little to no restrictions that God gave Adam and Eve. They had dominion over all of God's creation, save one thing. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. 
But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Very simple instructions that God gave to Adam and Eve. The simple instructions were on one side saying, you have dominion over everything that I have created. It is all yours. You have the rule over this, except except for one, one thing. Do not eat of the tree in the middle of the garden, for the day that you eat of that, you shall surely die. Man is never content with the amount of rule that they have over their lives. Nearly 99% of Adam and Eve's life was under their own will. God gave them dominion to exercise authority over what he had created. But in the one area that he didn't, that was the one area that they were most tempted by. And we know what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Satan came and tempted them and said, did God really say that you couldn't eat of this? Does God really have the rule over your life in this particular area? He's given you everything else. Surely he has not said that you can't have this also. In their temptation towards sin, they hated, they hated being governed by God and therefore they rebelled against him. And ever since then, man and women alike have inherited this sin nature that Adam and Eve possessed through the sin which they committed there on that day in the Garden of Eden. And therefore, from here on out, man and woman, until we are redeemed finally, those who are glorified, will be governed by their inability to submit to God in his sovereign ways. We hate being governed. We hate having people have rule over our lives. We hate having laws which restrict our ability to live as free individuals. Our very nation was founded upon this idea that all men and women are free. That we don't need to be under the rule of Britain. We don't need to be under the rule of some, uh, some, some government which is just seeking to oppress us and suppress our rights as individuals who are free in our expression and what we, and what we want to do. We hate being governed. And while laws are given to govern men in their totality, all men and women everywhere reject this rule over them. You see, the very thought of having someone over you just brings a sort of disgust to the free-minded culture we live today. Imagine someone says, you need to submit to me. You need to be subject to me. You are my subject. I am your ruler. What does that invoke within you in an emotional reaction or an emotional uh, idea? If someone says, you need to submit to me, immediately there's this rebellion. I don't need to submit to this guy. Who is this guy? Does this guy have rule over my life? We hate being governed. And in the same way, if we have the rule over someone else and they refuse to submit to us, well, then we get upset with that as well. I have three kids. Uh, there are le- or 12, 9, and 7. And we were talking about chores this week. I had a little conversation about it. And my kids all said to me, do we really have to listen to everything you tell us to do? Do I really got to obey what my dad says regarding the chores around the house? Now, they weren't saying it in sort of a a flippant reverence towards me where they were saying that they wanted to rebel against me totally. But there was some rebellion in that question. You know, okay, you're my dad, but do I really have to listen to everything you say? I have a son who has his uh, PS5 and and he he says, Dad, Dad, do I really have to listen to you when, when you tell me that I can't play on that all day long? It's my PS5, therefore I can do with it what I want. And that brings about all sorts of discussions. But but in reality, what it also shows to us here tonight is that no matter how old we are, whether we're seven, nine, twelve, like my children or grown men and women, we do not like to be governed. We want to be the rulers of our own domain. Now, in some respects, it is good that we have this this free minded thinking about ourselves to not be governed by someone is is a a free gift that God has given to us in the sense that he has given us dominion over that which he has created. Though it is uh, veiled for a time because of our sin, the reality is is we were created as free. We were created with a free will to be able to govern our lives. And so it's good to have this self-governed ideology amongst ourselves and amongst our peers. Especially as we live in a world which seeks to control our thoughts and manipulate our actions according to the cultural bends of their day. This is something that we see where individuals are controlled because they are just allowing for themselves to be governed without any sort of thought about the repercussions for that. 
We need to be on guard against those who have used their power of their control over us. And this ultimately involves keeping an open mind uh, and not a blind following of the status quo. However, and this is very important that you hear me in this, we must never lose sight of the fact that though we are free, though we have a, a mind which allows for us to think freely, to be able to make decisions, to be able to react, to be able to form an opinion about things, there is a, a, a limit to how far this can ultimately go. Sure, amongst our peers, we have this ability to be able to bounce ideas off of each other and give our opinions and to be able to state truths that we have uh, in and amongst our own uh, cultural norms or cultural understandings. But as this relates to God, this only goes so far. You see, God has set a limit on how far this goes. As we've seen in the Garden of Eden, God says, you can have dominion over everything that I've created. Just don't go there. Don't touch that. God says, if you go over this threshold, it is sin. And you have rebelled against me and therefore have fallen short of my glory. God is sovereign over us. God is sovereign over us. And even though we have this intellect, that we have this, this freedom of thought, we must not allow for that to cross the boundary where we make ourselves God and therefore try to subvert his ways and his rules. Now, someone might say to us, well, then this God is just some egotistical maniac who commands people to worship him. And therefore, I will never, never worship someone who's calling for me to do such a thing as this. The reality is, is we all submit ourselves to something or someone. If you don't submit yourself to God, you may be submitting yourself to the control of sin and its uh, constraining influence in your life. Some are controlled by their circumstances. Some are controlled by their emotions. Some are controlled by substances. All of us are governed by something. There is something which has the control or the rule over our lives. We are not autonomous. We are not as free as we think that we are. You see, in any way that we look at it, we are controlled by someone or something. But the reality is, and the desire for myself and for anyone who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is we need to come under the submission unto the one who has created us, that is God himself. And the reason is because he is our creator. He is the one who has created us and everything else that exists within this world. Therefore, by nature of the design of uh, God and man, or how God has designed man, we therefore must submit to him. We are the creation. He is the creator. He is the one who has the rule over us. There's an analogy in the scripture where you have the potter and the clay. And the potter is the one who creates the clay. If the potter says, I don't like this clay, the potter says, I can, you know, I can just bash this and throw it away. He's the creator. What right does the clay have to say to the potter who has formed it? You can't do this to me. God's in control over us. God is sovereign. And this is good news for us if we understand it rightly. Because if we are left to our own devices, we would destroy both ourselves and everything around us because of the nature of our sinfulness and our rebellion against God and his ways. Tonight, as we continue to consider the book of Habakkuk, we have before us a man like you and I who was faced with all sorts of fears and anxieties over the current condition of the world in which he lived. And if you've been with us, you will remember that in his life, in his time frame or his world, sin was rampant. There was evil everywhere. There was no justice happening. There was a, a flippant inability for individuals to respect God and God's laws, even though they knew his ways. They said, we're not going to do that. We're going to go our own way. And Habakkuk is left to question God to say, God, where are you at in all of this? Are you really the sovereign God who you say that you are? Are you really the creator? Have you lost control over your creation? Have they gone too far to the point where they have somehow subverted your ability to bring them back in and to reign and rule over them? He is questioning God, not from a heart of unbelief, but from a heart of belief, knowing that as he comes to God with a heart full of faith, God will hear him. God will hear his prayers and he will give him understanding about his ways. You see, to summarize Habakkuk's complaint to God, it is simply this. God, you're sovereign. You rule over everyone. How therefore can you allow evil to continue in, under your rule? How could you continue to let the wicked go unpunished while the righteous are killed? 
You see, he's wrestling with this question of God's sovereignty versus his perceived understanding of God's inactivity towards sin. And what we have done so far as we've considered this passage is to learn that in, in our own feeble minds, in our own inability to rightly understand everything because we don't have all knowledge, it may seem at a time that God's ways are mysterious to us. Habakkuk presents this in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 11. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago, where Habakkuk just had to realize that God's ways are higher than his. God is mysterious towards him to a certain extent. Mysterious and yet understood or understandable. The second thing that we learned is that even though God is able to be understood in his mysterious ways, is that we often will misunderstand what God is doing. And this leads to all sorts of distrust in our lives. And so therefore we need to seek God for wisdom and understanding. Here tonight, as we finish this portion of the book of Habakkuk, we look at God's response to Habakkuk in its totality. We look at how God responds to Habakkuk's misunderstandings of his ways in order that he is able to give Habakkuk a greater idea about who he is and what he is going to accomplish in the land of Judah. (coughs) I want you to just look again with me to Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5 to verse 6, because here in this particular portion is where we really see God responding to Habakkuk about all of the issues that Habakkuk sees in the society that he's in. Remember, Habakkuk says, God sends everywhere. You're not doing anything about it. Are you really sovereign? Habakkuk, or God answers Habakkuk saying in verse 5 of Habakkuk 1, Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. We learn of God's sovereignty in concerning his ways in this respect as we first take a look at verse 5. And that is that history is under God's control. That is, all of time, everything that happens does not go uh, on without God playing a a focused uh, focused role or focused part in it. Here, Habakkuk is saying to God, God, everything is falling apart. Sin is everywhere. People are rejecting your ways. Your law has been forsook. You are losing control over your creation. God, you've got to get it together here. Everything's going wrong. That's what Habakkuk's saying to God. And God says to Habakkuk, now you've forgotten who I am. Don't you worry. I have not turned a blind eye to this. I am still in control over all of history. Not just in pertaining to Habakkuk's particular situation, but God is in control over all history. Whether it's within the nation of Judah or whether it's in the nation of Babylon, which is the region that God is or the people that God is raising up to go and punish the nation of Judah or nation of Israel. God is in control over all of it. You see, God answers Habakkuk. I'm not blind to what is happening, nor am I relinquishing my control over this situation. All things are going according to plan. Now, Habakkuk doesn't necessarily like God's plan. Uh, We'll learn more of that in the next week as we look to verse 12 to verse 17. But nevertheless, God answers Habakkuk and says, listen, I still am the sovereign God. I have not changed. Just because you think that things are going wrong, all things are still in my control. God is in control. You see, contrary to what man thinks, God is not only in control over the people who follow him, the people who submit themselves to him. He is also in control over those who reject him and forsake his ways. Habakkuk here is a righteous man, one who is seeking to follow after the will of God. But everybody else around him, all of the people of Judah, the Chaldeans who God is raising up, none of these people are following after God. They do not submit to God's will. In fact, the Chaldeans, God says of them that they think that they are God. Their own might is their God. These people are not following God. They could care less about what God has to say to them. For the people of Israel, they know what God has said, and they simply say, God, we don't want anything to do with you or or what you're saying to us. For the Chaldeans, they say, who's God? We're God. They don't care about God, and yet God says, I am still in control over them, even if they reject my sovereign rule. You see, it doesn't matter if we think or don't think that God has control over us. He still is sovereign. It's who he is. 
The creator never becomes subject to the rule of his creation. We don't, we don't have to see that, even though people think we create robots and robots are going to kill us. The creator never becomes subject to his creation. You just unplug the battery of the robot and the robot's not able to do anything anymore. We never will become subject to the creation. Or the creator would never become subject to the creation. God's never going to become subject to us. Even if we rebel, he's still over that. He's still over it. In fact, what's interesting here is Habakkuk seems to have forgotten this reality that God promised to the people of Israel while they were still wandering in the wilderness. When Moses was leading the people out of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the slavery in Egypt and they were making it into the promised land, Moses was reciting the law for the individuals and he was telling them the curses that would come upon them if they failed to continue in God's ways. And one of those curses was that if you continue in sin, I'm going to send a nation that you do not know to come and punish you. God said that to them in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28, 49 to 50. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. The Chaldeans are coming, but this should not come as a surprise to Habakkuk. God said through Moses, listen, if you reject my ways, if you reject my sovereignty over your lives, punishment's going to come upon you. And it's going to come upon you through a nation which you do not know. I'm in control over everything, and so therefore I can use even a nation which does not care about me to punish you. Be sovereign, that God can do what he wants to do. You see, only God can warn about this ahead of time. God can warn about this ahead of time because he is in control of all of time and all of people. In Amos chapter 9, verse 7, God says, Are you not like the Cushites to me, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtor and the Syrians from Kerr? God says, I brought up the Israelites from the land of Egypt. I brought up the Philistines from Kaphtor and I brought up the Syrians from Kerr. I'm over all of these people. He's not the God only of Israel. He's not a tribal God. He is the one true God over all of the earth. There's no one. There's no other God beside him. There's no one else who exercises sovereignty or can exercise sovereignty over creation because God is the sovereign ruler of all. He is in control. There's a really cool example of this in Isaiah chapter 45, if you want to turn there with me to see it. In Isaiah chapter 45, Isaiah is prophesying prophesying about uh, a king who is going to come and to uh, uh, overthrow Babylon and to bring the people of God back into uh, Jerusalem. They will still be under this king's control, but this king is going to be raised up. And what's really interesting about this prophecy here is Isaiah prophesies some 200 years before this king even comes on the scene. And he calls him by name. And through history, world history, this is the very king who did what Isaiah said was going to happen and actually happened. God is just incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, gracious to us to show us the reality of who he is, that he is the ruler over all history by telling us history 200 years before it happens. In uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, the gates that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in the secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord and there is no other besides me. There is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. God is the ruler over all of all of creation. He is in control. God is in control of all things. Now, someone might ask, really, is God in control of all things? What about Satan? Is God in control of Satan? 
There is this idea that we as uh, individuals in the American culture in which we live through pop culture have had this idea brought to us that there is this sort of dualism going on between God and Satan. That, you know, sometimes God strikes his blow on Satan and knocks him down for a bit, but then Satan gets back up and strikes his blow at God. And, and there is this duality between the two where they are fighting against each other as equals. That's nonsense. Satan even though Satan is powerful, he is still a created being who rejected God, fell from heaven, and now lives under the rule of God, even though he continues to rebel against him. How do we know that Satan is under God's rule? He's got to ask God permission to do anything. In the book of Job, Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, Satan has to go to God and say, God, I want to show you that these people are following you only because of the prosperity that you've given to them. Job was a very wealthy man in a number of different respects. And Satan had this idea that, well, Job's only following God because of what God gives to him. And so rather than Satan just going to Job and, and persecuting him, he couldn't. God didn't give him permission to do that. Satan goes to God and says, I wish to persecute him. And God allows that to happen to Job. Satan has to ask God permission to do anything. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. In a very clear reference to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan had to go to God, the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, to ask to sift Peter, to demand him, to, to, to demand that, that I have Peter, but Christ only allows for it to go so far. You see, Satan must ask God for permission to do anything. He is not in control, and quite frankly, my friends, neither are we. We are not in control. In James chapter 4, verse uh, 1, I think, or uh, later in James chapter 4, I think it's verse 13, it says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. See, what this clearly shows to us is that God is in control over all things, over everything that has happened. Well, then someone might say to us then, well, how is it fair that he still holds us responsible for what we do? How is it right to say that God is sovereign over all things, that he is in control over everything and everyone? How is it right, therefore, then to say that we are responsible to God for what we do if he is in control of all things? There's quite a mystery in this. And yet God holds us accountable for the choices we make. Yet all the while asserts he is in control even of what we do. Acts chapter 2 verse 23 shows this, this, uh, 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 this situation really in perfection to us as we think about it. It says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Right here we have this idea of God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. Peter says to the people there on the day of Pentecost, Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God was in control of Jesus going to the cross to die for our sins. Yet, you crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. God's in control. Man's responsible. This is the reality that we must come under as God's creation. This is how God operates. God operates in the way in which he is in control. He is the one who is in control. And rather than this bringing fear to us, it can bring to us great comfort if we have a right relationship with him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the world operates off of fear. The world operates off of this idea where they can control you by scare tactics, by saying, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen to you. This, and it's not really going to happen because they have no control over whether or not it does happen to you. But if we follow God, if we know God, we do not need to fear anyone or anything, because even though things appear to be out of control to our limited perception, God is in control. That's the faith that Habakkuk ends up having at the end of Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter three. 
He says, though all control is lost, though I lose all my food, though I lose all of my possessions, though I lose even my life, yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation, for he is in control. Still, secondly, we learn this about God's plan from verse 5 to verse 6. In uh, verse 5 specifically, it says, For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. The second thing that we know about God and his sovereignty is he has a plan. God says to Habakkuk, I'm aware of what's happening. I know that judgment needs to come. I recognize that my people have rebelled against me for far too long and discipline will be on the table for them as my plan comes to completion. You see, in other words, Habakkuk is answered to by or God answers Habakkuk with the utmost authority that only he has saying here, Habakkuk, you want to know what's going to happen? This is what is going to happen. My friends, it's one thing to be in control, but it's another thing to have a plan to keep that control going forward. We live in a nation today where it seems that you have one side trying to control things this way and another side trying to control things that way. But there is no plan to bridge those two sides together to create a united nation, a United States of America, which is what we are called. We have many who are in leadership today in our great nation who do not have a plan to bring the United States of America back together. It's one thing for them to have control. It's another thing for them to have a plan to keep that control. Uh, Man does not have an ability to do this, but God does. God not only is sovereign, God not only has control, but he has a plan which will bring all things to completion. You see, all of history has behind it its purpose of God's divine plan. Things do not just happen. Things are not accidental. Wars do not just start. Everything follows a divine plan. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Does he seek counsel from me or from you? No. His own will leads to his good counsel. God has got it in control. God has a plan. The scriptures say in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, the heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. Psalm chapter 127, verse 1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. This says, you can have your plans. You can have a plan to build a house. If God doesn't build that house, that house is not getting built no matter how hard you try. You could have a plan to protect that house or to protect your nation. If God is not protecting that nation, you're watching it in vain. If God does not have his plan, uh, uh, if God's plan is not your plan, your plan is not going to happen. God's plan will come to pass. God will not stop and consult with us concerning our plan versus his. His plan overrules all. There's a scripture in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33, which shows us God's sovereignty over all things in a very simple form. It says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. This is in our day a reference to those who might play dice. When you roll the dice and the numbers come up, We might give that up to chance. You roll the dice and you get a two or a five. What the scripture says here is the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from God. They would uh, throw they would take these stones sometimes or these lots, what they would call, and they would put them in a bag. And they say, if this one comes out, this is what we're going to do. If this one comes out, this is what we're going to do. And if that one comes out, this is what we're going to do. And they'd shake it up and then they'd pour it out. And the first one that came out, that was what's going to happen. Anyway, they'd say, well, we'll just leave it up to chance. No. No, no, no. What the scripture says is you do that, but the decision is from the Lord. He is in control of all things, and he has a plan to bring them to completion. There's an idiom in the scripture which the Bible uses to refer to the fact that God uh, has a plan which is going to come to completion. It is an idiom or a statement or a figure of speech which is under this terminology of when the fullness of time came. When the fullness of time came, this happened. Paul on two occasions uses this idiom to describe the uh, coming together of God's plan of redemption through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. 
And another example is, I believe, in the book of Galatians. Uh, he says, when the fullness of time came, God came, or I say, this is in Ephesians, God uh, uh, chose to unite all things in him, that is, his son. In other words, what the scripture is saying here is when the time is right, God will bring about his plan to completion. God not only follows the divine plan, he has a divine timetable. And while God could certainly fulfill his plan immediately for his own sovereign reasons and sovereign purposes, he has a divine timetable also, which will dictate when things come to pass. They will not happen a moment too soon or a moment too late. They will happen right on time. You see here Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter 1 is crying out to God. God, when are you going to punish the wicked? Do it now. Listen, God, how long do I got to cry out to you violence and you don't act? How long do I have to say we're suffering and you just let the suffering continue? Act. Do it now, God. Do it now. Now. All right, he's calling out to God and saying, God, I need you to do this now. And God says, listen, I'm sovereign. I am in control. I have a plan. I'm raising up the Chaldeans and the Chaldeans are going to come and they are going punish you. That's the plan. And Habakkuk must surrender to the will of God for his life. This begs the question for us here tonight. What is God's plan for us and how do I get in line with it? Well, I tell you, it is all wrapped up in the same uh, reason that God acted on Habakkuk's behalf in Habakkuk chapter one. It is all wrapped up. God God, uh, uh, does all things for the purpose of his plan for the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of God. You see, Habakkuk was a part of the people of God, that is Israel, his chosen people, a people holy unto to himself, a people whom the Messiah would come through. And here was this people who knew better, who had the law and were rebelling against law, the God's law. And they were going to kill themselves, ultimately, if God did not act. They were just killing each other. There's no justice. There's no punishment. Eventually, the Israelites were going to wipe themselves out because they were fighting against each other. The very people who were one, one nation under God, they're going to kill themselves. God needed to act. His covenant, his people, his promise. And that's really where Habakkuk is is crying out to God from a heart of. God, what about your promises? God, what about the fact that it is coming through our line or our nation that the Messiah will come? God, we're going to kill ourselves if you don't act here. But God says, don't you worry. All things according to my plan for the kingdom of my beloved son, the kingdom of God, are going to be brought to completion. You see, Israel was heading on a crash course towards total ruin. But God would not allow that. God would not allow that because God had a particular perfect plan to bring his Messiah through his people that he called out for his own possession through Abraham. You see, God marked out a people for his own possession. He called Abraham, who was a Gentile living in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans and said, I am going to make of you a great nation. If you follow me, if you trust me, I am going to, from your seed, bring about a great nation, a people who are going to outnumber the stars, a people who are going to draw all nations unto yourself because of the glory that comes through the people of God, the people of Israel. You see, it was through these people that the Messiah would come, God's beloved beloved son. And the scripture tells us when the fullness of time came, God did send forth his beloved son into the world to destroy the devil and sin through his death on the cross, bringing atonement for his sin, for our sins. And it is now through faith in Jesus Christ, God's beloved, beloved son, that all who believe unto him will be ushered into the kingdom of God. In which we do not have Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Rather, in the kingdom of God, we are all one in Christ Jesus. My friends, the scriptures are not a collection of this uh, authoritarian God who wishes to control his people. Rather, the scriptures are God's revelation to us of how he is going to redeem a people back to himself. How the sovereign God is going to save his people from his wrath for their sins, which they've committed, which they are responsible for, in order to allow for us to dwell with him for all of eternity and all of his perfection. You see, God's plan of redemption is shown to us through the scriptures to bring us into his beloved son's kingdom, revealing to us the kingdom of God, which brings us out of the kingdom of darkness, which we are now in, and ushering us into the kingdom of his beloved son. 
God's plan for Habakkuk was the same plan for our lives as well, too, if we are following after him with a heart full of faith. And that is to bring us into the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of God. And this is what he's doing even now in Colossians chapter one, verse 13 to 14. Paul says he has delivered us from the domain of darkness of the kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, as it is now, all who are alienated from God, both now and forever will be in the kingdom of darkness under the wrath of God because of their sinfulness. But through Jesus Christ, you can be transferred to the kingdom of God and Jesus will bring you in. Jesus will usher you in to the kingdom of the sovereign God who we have been learning about here in the book of Habakkuk. You see, what Habakkuk tells us concerning this is that God's plan is coming to completion. God's plan is going to come to completion. The kingdom of God is going to come. The kingdom of God will be brought to its consummation. The Messiah will still come, even though Habakkuk thinks that the kingdom of Israel is falling apart because God is doing nothing about it. Habakkuk shows to us that though Israel consistently rebelled against God, though they tried to establish their own kingdom apart from God and his ways, God would not allow for them to prosper. Those of them who were from the wicked uh, line would be defeated, as well as any other kingdom which tried to come against God's kingdom. My friend, today the church exists not because men and women prop it up together. The church exists today not because of its resources. It does not exist because of its political affiliations nor through its organizational structure. The church exists because there is a sovereign God who has said that the gates of hell shall not prevail upon his people, upon his church, upon his kingdom. You say, sure, that's right. No, you might might be uh, a a bit of a uh, uh, saying, no, you take away the money, you take away the politics, you take away all of the the, the protections that you get from the society and the church would crumble. As Elon Musk said, you know, if the church doesn't stand up for itself, it's going to fall apart. He just said that a couple of of days ago. That is a wrong idea on a number of on a number of levels. In the one sense, you take away the financial resources, you take away its political uh, affiliations, you take away its organizational structures, and you still have the church. The church is not an organization. The church does not exist because of its finances. The church does not exist because of its political prowess. The church exists because it is a living organism under Jesus Christ. It is a people of God who have been brought into God's kingdom spiritually now, but will be ushered into it forevermore when Christ returns to bring us to himself. You look at the early church. They didn't have money. They didn't have political organizations tied to them. They didn't have any organization. They had nothing. And yet they took over the whole Roman Empire. How? Was it because they were just able to just uh, 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 rule them through military prowess? No. They would have been destroyed by Rome. Rome was the nation which had sovereignty over all of the created world. No, they were under the rule of the God who is over all people and all nations, even the Roman Empire. The church continues today because God is bringing it to completion. Jesus says to us, and we'll close with this idea here, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus says, The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then will the end come. Jesus says in that same passage, no one knows the day or the hour, but that is going to happen. And what the book of Habakkuk tells us here tonight is that we must understand that God is in control of all of this. God is in control of bringing about the consummation of his kingdom, his kingdom, wherein all of the righteous will be ushered into by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and where all of the wicked will be rejected from and damned to an eternity in hell. My friends, the relevance of your life and my life only finds its true meaning as it relates to God and his kingdom. You may be going through your life today thinking that you have ultimate control over your destiny, that you are the ruler of your own domain. And for a time, God may allow that for you in his providence. But there is coming a day when you will come under his sovereignty like no other. You will stand before his son, Jesus Christ, face to face on that day of judgment. 
And if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, he will say, depart from me. I never knew you and you will be damned into an eternity in hell under the sovereign wrath of God, which will be poured out upon you for all time. His judgment will be swift, far more powerful and effective than any nation which has risen and fallen throughout human history. But also there is this, the good news. His mercy for you will be even greater if right now you put your faith in his son who promises to bring you into his kingdom forever and ever. While the word history is unrelated to the play on words that we often give towards it, I think it gives a a good close to this passage here tonight. History is his story. It is God's story. We are merely a part of his story. We are merely a part of history. God is the author, and he will bring it to completion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening here tonight where we have been able to come together as men to be able to really consider that which has the utmost importance of relevance for our lives today. That is as, that is, as it pertains to our relationship towards you and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray that if anyone here today is not right with you because they have not yet repented of their sin and placed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that your spirit would convict them now to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his redemptive work, in in, in, in his vicarious blood, in his bodily resurrection, knowing that he is going to return for us, to bring us to you, God, to bring us into your everlasting kingdom. God, we look forward to that day. And in the meantime, Lord, I pray you would bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen.